Good morning. It is a beautiful morning in New York, in the city that never sleeps. Some of you probably uh, didn't see the beautiful morning if you were out late, so I hope you can help me bring some energy into the room with a hearty good morning. Okay, we're gonna work on that, but that was pretty good. And I will just tell you that day two is always harder. So when Kathy's up here after you've enjoyed a nice night in New York tonight, please give her a hearty good morning tomorrow morning. But welcome to the eighth annual Shared Value Summit. My name is Justin Backley, I'm the Executive Director. On behalf of the Shared Value Initiative, our partners, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us from around the world. So many of you come from different corners of the globe to be with us here in New York, and we really thank you. Wanted to start with a quick uh, recognition and thanks to our sponsors, Nestle, Arauco, BD, Novo Nordisk, CJ Logistics, Barclays, Abbott, Tableau, Comonix, and Pixar Global. If you've ever done an event in New York, you know how challenging it is, and I thank these organizations for supporting us and helping make it a reality. Equally as important is that these companies are also making substantial contributions and input into the initiative and the ideas and advancing shared values, so thank you. I want to join, uh, thank and, uh, the folks who are joining us on the live stream today from around the world. We typically draw thousands of participants from uh, every year, more than 60 countries from around the globe that join to listen into these sessions, so I want to thank them for being with us as well. And of course, encourage you to use social media, hashtag shared value, excuse me, SV leaders over the next couple of days and, and tweet out uh, what, you're, what you're seeing here during the, the day's events. The other thing I would say just as a way of welcome is if you need anything, please just let us know. We work with an event firm called Impulse. For those of you who have been with us for the last few years, you know they help us put on a great event. Uh, Cheryl and Scott and their team are here. The hotel staff here at the Conrad is fantastic. And please just let us know what you need to make uh, uh, the event a productive one for you. As an example, you'll see in our bulletin, we uh, provide a room for nursing mothers. If you have that need, let us know and we can um, accommodate you appropriately. And if there's anything else like that that you need, please let us know. Now, over the next couple of days, we use the Bizabo app and we use a platform called Slido that helps uh, ask questions. So we no longer go with the mics in the room, but we use a technology platform to ask questions of our speakers. And you will find directions in your program. You can either access Slido through the Visibo app, which is also how you can connect with uh, all of the attendees and participants here over the next two days, or you can use it directly on slido.com using hashtag SV leaders, as you'll see in your, um, in your program. Now, I wanted to start with a quick reflection, uh, probably a little bit of foreshadowing of what Professor Michael Porter will talk about in his opening remarks, but I've been thinking for the last year or so about the idea and shared value of strength and fragility. What is it for companies that are pursuing shared value that indicates situations of strength and really being successful? And what about situations of fragility? And last year, sort of in quick order, uh, you may have seen the news. It didn't ha all happen exactly at once, but in relatively short order, there was um, a bid for an external uh, private equity firm to try to purchase Unilever and then an activist investor that took a big position in Nestle, and uh, a similar approach to Whole Foods, uh, which was ultimately bought by Amazon. And of course, you know, the re most recent letter from Larry Fink, something that Michael will talk about this morning, has also made great waves and have had a lot of conversations through this community about that, what this means for companies. But six months before that letter, we had a situation where these companies were under pressure from uh, external investors. To me, it really was an ex existential moment as I realized that leaders like Peter Brabeck and Paul Pullman and John Mackey, that the legacies that they had built in their companies, which to me were very much either shared value aligned or, or you know, obviously in the case of Nestle has been on the journey with us for all these years, 
it was clear to me that we were at a moment of understanding and trying to see whether those legacies would hold up, an existential moment. But what are embedded in these scenarios when investors like that take a position in these companies? I think there's two dimensions that are key to think about. The first is, an, is a dimension of control. Who is really in control of the future and the strategic direction of the company? Is it the management team and the CEO? Is it the board? Or is it the activist investor that comes in with a few billion dollars demanding change? When the news broke about Whole Foods, probably like many of you, I read some of the comments from John Mackey, uh, you know, and talking about how he had delivered uh, basically 20 years of year-on-year -year growth and tremendous results. And yet in the last two years where that growth had faltered, the market all of a sudden had a mindset of what have you done for me lately? So I was curious and I looked it up and is it, you know, as a rhetorical question, does anyone know how much John Mackey owned of Whole Foods at the moment when Jeff Bezos bought it? The answer is less than 1%. So control, who has control of the company? But within control and within either a management or board team or within an activist investor, there's a secondary question of what's the vision for how value is created in that business? Is it a shared value mindset and being aligned with society? Or is it a short-term next quarter mindset? So if you believe in shared value and you want to move from this potential moment of fragility to strength, uh, how do you do that? How do you do that? And there's a few things that I have in mind. One is the proximity to business strategy and the proximity to how your business competes. And are the social and environmental issues you're working on very close and aligned with that business strategy or far? Close, if you're working on issues that are very close to your future, you're in a position of strength. If they're far or disassociated from really how your business will compete today and in the future, you're in a moment of fragility. You know, the CEO activism, obviously driven from many different corners, uh, you know, over the last few years has been great. It's been wonderful to hear the voices of CEOs on many different social issues. And obviously for CEOs, I think sometimes there can just be a moral imperative to speak out about what they see in the world. But that being said, when I listen to CEOs, I'm always asking myself on the issues they're talking about, what's the proximity to their business strategy and their future? The further you go from business strategy, the more fragile you become. So for all of us in the room then, the question becomes, how do we move ourselves collectively towards strength and shared value? Now there's some universal truths I would say from our last decade, decade and a half of work in this area and seeing shared value. Number one, there's not one pathway. We work with companies who are very culture driven. They'll say to me, we need to embed this thinking in the culture. We work with other companies that are very process driven. They say if it's not built into the planning and how we uh, plan our business at a country level or a business unit level, uh, the change won't happen. The journey, of course, for companies is not a straight line. And I've often felt in the existence of the Shared Value Initiative, we're both one part think tank and, and working with all of you. And in another sense, we're one part sort of therapy organization because of the change that happens in organizations, successes and failures. And companies aren't one thing in one moment in time, but they're changing at all times. Number three, the journey, of course, of Shared Value is best taken together not by companies acting alone, but companies acting in concert, in partnership with civil society and governments. And the best companies, of course, tap into all of the pieces of the corporate social engagement toolkit, finding ways to spend a lot less time debating what's shared value, what's philanthropy, and what's CSR, and using them all strategically in the ways that they're most effective. But time after time, when I come back to the best examples I see from this community, it's because of issues that are proximate to business strategy and how companies compete. So who, who are we as the Shared Value Initiative? Obviously, we're very proud to put on this event all year, but we have a year-round set of activities that could be best summed up by saying, we're helping all of you move from fragility to strength in shared value. You'll see throughout our summit agenda of the next couple of days that we have things that help illustrate this this morning. We'll hear from um, Alessandra Benetton from a private equity viewpoint of how to create shared value. 
Uh, Vishal will talk to us about how venture capital can help achieve the same goals. And of course, we'll hear from CEO Roger Ferguson talking about TIAA, a large investment management company, and how it thinks about shared value. We'll hear from Deval Patrick tomorrow, uh, now running the Bain Double Impact Fund, but of course also having a background in both corporate work and in government. Then yesterday, we ran a partner day because we have a year-round set of activities with all the partners of the Shared Value Initiative. And in that, we worked on what we're calling a shared value enterprise model that really talks about how do we steward and foster the creation of shared value in the change process in the company. Again, embedding it in shared value. We also work on intellectual capital. And right now, one of the most interesting things we have going on, there's a breakout session that many of you are going to attend, is how do we make the business case for ecosystem investments? Long-term investments that help craft and build, uh, build ecosystems for business success, but that require multi-sector activity. And then finally, we're proving shared value works on issues of importance. And tomorrow you'll hear from Kathleen McLaughlin, a very inspirational leader from Walmart, and our colleague Nicole Trimble talking about how we're doing work to activate HR systems within companies to really engage underserved opportunity youth in the United States in not only getting a job, but in what career pathways look like. Always as the shared value initiative that we are really trying to move from fragility to strength in shared value. So to continue with that, and in the opening of today, I really wanted you to have a sense of what our partner community and the work that we're doing is like. So I'd, uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Maria Cristina Papetti from NL. She is a member of the Shared Value Initiative Leadership Council. I'm really honored and a little bit also thrilled about with pleasure led to this opening that was not even in my wishing list when I started my CSV journey at an app. This is what I would like to talk to you about. Um, it's a journey, as many of you on the line also yesterday. We started uh, this journey at an app in 2012. And actually, we started in a small renewable company inside the huge group at the time. And we did it because uh, we wanted to grow in the market. And most of all, in the emerging market, thanks to the renewable energy. Something that only a few years ago, um, no one would bet a dime, we know. Uh, what happened uh, later on, what, what's happening nowadays, uh, we are talking about an industry in renewables that are counting more or less investments each year in the last two years of more than 300 billion US and employing people all over, more or less than 9 million nowadays, all over the world. So we started at the time, it was tough, and we soon understood that to grow, most of all in the so-called emerging markets, uh, the old um, corporate social responsibility approach was unfit, was not enough. And so we started and we jumped into the creating shared value article, and we decided to go straight into sure that methodology because what we did, uh, we customized internally and we started considering and taking into account, first of all, our value chain. And that was, let's say, the starting point because when we start uh, simply spreading that theory into the value chain, I mean into the business development phase, the engineering and construction and the operation and maintenance, we soon understood that we were engaging the people from the business lines, first of all. So we are, we're also making a very strong cultural mindset change. And that paid off. So we started that way, we grow, we grow a lot in those years, and what happened was that in 2014, that visionary man that was leading the renewable energy company called Energy Green Power took the edge of the group. It was 2014 and he soon decided to spread the same approach all over the group. It was not that easy, as you can imagine, because we were talking about all thermal generation assets that are in operation and that, that making our EBITDA. But we start questioning and the first question was quite simple, was uh, 
what is the role of a utility nowadays? Uh, I think that this is the question that each single corporation dealing with a single and, and industry should, should ask uh, at a certain point. But that was the key turning point to understand that we need to change our strategy completely if we wanted to stay, and on, not only stay, let's say, if we wanted to lead the energy sector in the next years, I mean in the long run. And to set also the business purpose was crucial. And the business purpose, just to sum it up and make it easy, is quite simple to us. It's two simple words, open power. To us, open power means opening energy access to more people. To more people and energy, energy should be clean, reliable, and affordable. And it goes straight to the second point, opening up to new technologies, because to have energy that is clean, reliable, and affordable, you should have a lot of innovation. And in most of the cases, innovation is not inside the company, it's outside the company. And outside the company push a lot also the innovation inside the company. And then we said, okay, it's also the case to open up the energy, the new ways of energy, so that people can also get the technology in their own hands to cope, for instance, with the issue of rural electrification in isolated areas. And last is open up to new partnership. So this is the main frame, which is our strategy that is moving NL and will move in NL in the next years. And it's going to pay a lot, it's paid off a lot up to now. Uh, it's not over because uh, it's a path, it's a long journey. And this long journey um, also means that we are going to change during the path because there is a lot of complexity to take into account. And for instance, the new challenge we are trying to face nowadays is also moving a little step further with our stakeholders. And so that's why the last question we are asking, we are asking ourselves and to our stakeholders nowadays is another apparently quite simple. And the question is, what's your power? To us, what's your power means, uh, what is your talent, what is your knowledge, what is your expertise, uh, what you can share with all of us in order to better the world. So what does it mean? Simply is the ecosystem approach we really want to deploy all over. This, that's it. It's a journey. We are on the path, hopefully on the right one, but we are really passionate and we love it. And so we really would like to share with you all also this opportunity because it's a land of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Cristina. Uh, now I want to welcome to the stage Helen Steele. Helen Steele is the executive director of the Shared Value Project, which uh, approximates what the Shared Value Initiative does globally, but in uh, Australia. And um, Helen has been leading this. Come on up, Helen. Helen has been leading this since uh, since the inception. It was started with uh, the chairman Peter Yates, who's sitting up front here and is a great example of how we try to partner and work with others to advance shared value in their geography. So please join me in welcoming Helen. Thanks so much, Justin. And just to let you know, I have actually had a promotion. Um, I am now the CEO of the Shared Value Project, so um, just, just, just update your, your, your... Thank you, thank you. So um, Justin has given me six minutes to sort of share with you some of our journey, um, a, a very short period of time. I did think that perhaps some sort of interpretive dance routine might be exciting for this group first thing in the morning, but I, uh, sadly, I wasn't able to get my act together and, and Murray, Christina and I were thinking of, you know, working on this actually quite actively in Australia recently, but couldn't get it together, so he here I am. 
Um, so we began our journey uh, in, in 2011, shortly after reading the, um, the original article. My uh, colleague and co-founder of the Shared Value Project, Rod Ellis Jones, brought this article to me. And look, I guess it really captured uh, my imagination. I had not long returned from quite an extensive period here in the US working in the CSR world. And what I was experiencing in Australia upon my return was, was vastly different than the mature CSR conversation we were having here in the US. So when we read the article, we thought, well, this is a relatively simple idea, as of course all you know now, it, it's a very complex uh, conversation. But we started that uh, informal dialogue back in 2011 and created what has now become uh, the Shared Value Project. So one of the things that became apparent to us in, in those early days was that leadership was going to be vital to this, to this conversation. Um, and, uh, and so I invited uh, Peter Yates, who's now our chair, um, to participate in some informal dialogues. And I say invite, but really it was cajoling, persuading, persuading him that this idea had some merit and giving him some confidence that we invited some of his, his, leader, his colleagues um, that we could have a robust discussion. Fortunately, Peter did, um, did accept the challenge and we started with some, we started that very first dialogue. I was reflecting today, we had BHP in the room, we had National Australia Bank, we had PwC, AIA Australia. We had some very powerful organisations um, and what began is, is an informal discussion, but we realised that you know, there was something here. Um, and as I recall, uh, uh, I, we first came to the attention of FSG not long after that, when we, Rod and I, brought up every domain name that we possibly could around shared value, and we had the idea that we could trademark the concept. Um, as it turned out, we could not. But FSG got on the phone to us and said, hey, what are you Australians doing down there? Um, what's going on? Do you want to have a discussion? Um, so what actually began there was what has ultimately become uh, an important relationship with us as we embarked on sort of de developing towards becoming the first regional partner of the Shared Value Initiative. Um, by the way, if anyone in Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia or Singapore is thinking about starting up Shared Value Project, I've got the domain name for you and we'll sell it to you at a very good rate. <laughs> so as our journey um, progressed, the FSG announced their first affiliate consulting training. Hands up if any of you went to that. I went along to that with my colleague Rod Ellis Jones. Anyone else attend that first session back in 2013? No, wow. Um, so we kind of spent three days in Boston trying to work out what on earth this concept shared value was. It was a very robust discussion. A lot of us had difficulty getting beyond the CSR conversation. Um, so I kind of came away from that possibly not having much more clarity around the idea of shared value, but what was very clear to me was that there was this sense of excitement and the beginnings of what has now become a global community. I also remember quite vividly the last slide that they showed as part of that session, which said sharedvalue.org. Well, we bought the domain name sharedvalue.org.au, so it seemed natural that we would be having or starting a conversation about creating a partnership, which we ultimately have. So what's going on in Australia? I mean, I think it's fair to say, and I've got Michael and Mark um, um, to my right, that when they created or wrote this article, they weren't thinking about Australia, a, a very developed country. They were thinking about emerging markets. Um, so the fact that it's very much captured the imagination of the corporate sector in Australia, I think is somewhat surprising to everyone, perhaps even a little bit amusing. But I think what it goes to say is that no matter how a, a country or a region is developed, um, everybody f faces social issues, many of us the same social issues. And, and I think interestingly in Australia, because we're geographically surrounded by many emerging markets, I mean, the conversation now naturally has evolved for us to have that regional discussion and be thinking beyond just what can happen in Australia. Although, 
Um, for those of you who don't know, Mark Kramer also sits on our board of directors. And, and Mark, two years ago, um, seeded this idea that Australia could actually become a shared value nation. Now, um, to, to pose that idea to someone like me, who, who is obviously quite audacious, um, you know, it, it really has got us thinking about what would a shared, shared value nation look like and how could we actually drive that and realise that possibility. So we held our conference, uh, our summit, in Australia two weeks ago. We do need to have a better conversation, Justin, about scheduling the timing so it's not quite so chaotic for all of us. But look, that conversation for us was certainly the most mature discussion we'd had. It was very much going back to a corporate discussion. Um, and what was we, it was remarkable the, the calibre of speakers we had, the number of um, we mentioned boards just earlier, the number of chairs from Australia's top listed companies who actually spoke at the conference and the number of CEOs. And that was also reflected in the, in the, delegate, in the delegates who were there. But I think rather than me um, continue to better illustrate the sense of excitement that we've generated in Australia, I'd like to show you this brief video.
Thank you, Helen and Maria Christina. Good morning. I'm Mark Kramer, the co-author with Michael Porter of the Creating Shared Value article and a co-founder with Michael of FSG. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the eighth annual Shared Value Summit. Uh, I have just a couple thoughts uh, to share before um, I invite Michael up uh, to kick us off. Uh, but first, I'd like to ask uh, Justin Backley to come back up. As some of you know, uh, this is Justin's last Shared Value Summit. He has decided to move on in June to the next adventure in life. And I just wanted to say a few words because ideas are important, but they're just ideas. It is really uh, people that animate them, that make them happen. Justin has built a great team at the Shared Value Initiative, but he really has become the global ambassador for Shared Value that has spread awareness an understanding of this concept all over the world. And um, it really is our tremendous privilege that Justin has led this effort these years. We have immense gratitude. None of us would be here without Justin. So please join me in thanking him for his years of service. I just want to share a, a quick thought. You know, we often say that we disagree with Milton Friedman, who said the business of business is profit. And we do disagree in the sense that he meant business shouldn't think about social or environmental consequences that are externalities. But in another sense, you know, creating shared value is about competitive advantage. And competitive advantage is about achieving superior profitability. And so in that sense, we don't really disagree. But I was thinking, I think our disagreement actually goes back much further to a different business leader. 130 years ago, Andrew Carnegie, in the Gospel of Wealth, also said that business, that it would be wrong for business to think about the welfare of society as part of its business strategy. He said, if I pay my employees more, we'll go out of business. Our competitors will win. The right thing to do is to run your business as a rigorous business. And then when you've made money, become a philanthropist and give it away. And that's the noble thing to do. And I believe that really was the origin of this great divide that has so many of us in the world believing that either you're here to make money or you're here to do good. And that those two don't go together. And of course, that's what we've come to see as being wrong, as being a false choice, as being a choice that has really blinded us to immense opportunity, both to do more good and to create greater profit. There are many movements today that are trying to redefine the role of business in society. What distinguishes the concept of creating shared value, I believe, is that it doesn't just tell you what you ought to do, but it begins to tell you how to do it. That together with Professor Porter, we really are building out a curriculum in business schools, in settings like this, in other conferences, to try and teach people how to think differently about the strategic decisions they face to recognize the interdependence between business and society. And that's really the core of why we're here today. 